Good morning. Wow, there's a big group, and I'm I was saying earlier I'm really excited to see a group this big because I'm fi I'm finishing a year of undergraduate research on online deliberation at the Evergreen State College. I just graduated with my computer science degree, and I have spent the last year um, working with mostly offline deliberationists um, through the National Coalition of Dialogue and Deliberation, NCDD. You can find them. It's a very interesting group of people if you're interested in deliberation. Um, you can find them at ncdd.org. And it's an organization with, mm, I think they're saying 1,100 or 1,400 members nationwide. They have a conference every two years. And it's public administrators, scholars, um, people that are different kinds of facilitators and moderators. And they use deliberative and dialogue methods um, offline to engage for civic engagement and to engage the public for different kinds of change. They largely use offline methodologies. And there's a big push over there to scale up um, and use online methods so that they can get broader and more effective civic engagement. Um, when I went to their conference in October, I was one of about five developers with like 400 people. And the rest of my year has kind of mirrored that experience where I've done a lot of outreach with different kinds of activist groups um, and civic engagement groups that need online tools but, and have offline methods but don't really know how to get, a, get, get them or don't really know what they need. Um, I, I make a lot of jokes about this, about being the only developer in the room because you know, I'm always saying, I want a UML diagram. And what they give me is interpretive dance. <laughs> but part of the struggle, I think, it's been really, really rewarding. And if you're interested in civic engagement and in civic engagement technology, um, one of the, the best things I can recommend is that you find groups um, locally or, or on a larger spectrum, but I'm a big fan of like local change. And find groups that are local to you that have your civic interests at heart and, um, and volunteer your time. Like find out what they need, what kind of technologies they need, and then see if you can build something. Because a lot of times they do have technology needs. You will be surprised at how they are just you know, they, a lot of groups don't even have a website. They need email solutions. They need maybe an app here and there. And a lot of them for us as developers would be quick and dirty projects, you know. Um, usually volunteering, you can't write off your time, but you can write off your, um, you can write off materials or travel. So uh, if you're working for a nonprofit. So just keep that in mind because a great way to get started is to get started offline, just visit an offline group, hang out with the people, and be like, and by the way, I'm a developer. Um, so my sponsor for my undergraduate research was Doug Schuler. Um, he's written maybe three or four books published through MIT Press about online deliberation. Um, who here, like raise your hand, does anybody know deliberation? When I say deliberation, you know what I mean? Yeah. OK, so let's talk about that. Um, first off, deliberation is. Um, essentially just a discussion where you're going to make a decision. And the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation um, shows what they call four streams of deliberative practice. And one of these is really prominent online. First one is um, an exploratory deliberation. And this is essentially where one individual is going to look at their community um, and see what everybody else says in order to make a personal decision. Our best online version of this is Amazon Reviews, where you see what everybody else thinks about the book to decide whether or not you want to buy the book. Um, some of the other ones that we see that are less well represented online um, and are very necessary online are conflict transformation. Like typically conf conflict transformation is like victim offender programs or reparations conversations. Um, those are usually handled by a specially trained facilitator and are usually very intimate. And so we don't see much of that online. 
But um, a great example of it, I think that is kind of an emergent version of that, is Dr. Batia Friedman's um, Rwanda project, where she interviewed the people that were on the Justice Council doing um, crimes, you know, war crimes in, or the genocide, the crimes, people involved in the, the Rwandan genocide. The tribunal that was overseeing the judging of those criminals and the testimony, she has hundreds, even thousands of hours, I think, of video interviews with those people. And those videos are posted online and people can mark out the videos, um, can tag the videos with what they think the lessons learned are from the conversations. Um, they can also mark little clips and give what they think is an explanation about it. Um, so this is also, this is a conflict transforma transformation um, kind of deliberation where we're having a we're having a conversation maybe to change change the result or change the lesson you know um, see what we can get out of the out of the conflict and it this version of it um, has a very exploratory feel again where one individual is talking to their community and making their own decision about the, the situation um, other kinds of deliberation are when a group of people get together and try and make one decision. Now this is where the rubber hits the road, in my opinion. Um, it can be very tricky. Uh, this would be collaborative action, where a group of people get together and decide what action to take. Now we have tons of online applications where people will say, okay, let's go do this, you know, and then everybody signs up. But if everybody's going to make the decision about what to do, that's another level, right? Um, and then also what, what NCDD calls decision making, which would be like parliamentary procedures, where a group of people needs to get together and make a legally or logically defensible decision. And it's probably going to be written down. Um, and everything has to be hammered out you know, very perfectly in words. Parliamentary procedures include Robert's Rules of Order, um, which is used by you know, almost half a million groups nationwide um, to make decisions, run meetings. Town council, county council meetings are often run with Robert's Rules of Order. And it's that thing where it's like, make a motion, you second the motion, and it goes through this whole thing. So when we talk about deliberative practices, um, one of the things that we want to talk about right off the bat is that there's a difference in the kind of communication. As you become more structured in your deliberation, um, you move from having unmitigated, or from having mitigated to unmitigated communication. And what I mean by that is, <laughs> I refer to it as a spectrum, from the fuzzy sweaters to the technocrats. Now in a room full of developers, most of the people are technocrats, and we tend to use unmitigated communication. But mitigated communication means that you're frequently using the passive voice. Um, you may be using honorifics. Uh, the language is a lot softer. And so an example of that is like where some of you, if somebody walks in the room and I say, Madam, um, there's an empty seat here because I want her to sit there. As a developer, I'd probably say, sit there. <laughs> and that's unmitigated communication. No gravy, right? As you progress and you need people to make decisions in your application, if you, want to build a, if you want to build an application for collaborative action or for a legally, logically defensible position, you need to give people tools to, make, to have unmitigated communication, which is often considered rude. Not among us, but among the fuzzy sweaters. Um, which is most of the world, you know, most of the world. So, Time becomes the most critical resource as you move across that spectrum. And when we get into parliamentary procedures, you'll notice a host of tools that will make it easier for people to communicate in an unmitigated way. Um, so the deliberative feature set. When we talk again about um, Amazon reviews, and I'll, when I talk about websites, I'll post, I don't know if I'm going to get mine up, I'll see if I'm connected to the network, but. Um, yeah, it's still not going for me. But I will post a list of deliberative sites. So don't worry if you don't, if I'm just spitting it out and you don't get the link. Um, and you can explore them on your own. But some of them are really familiar. 
So when we talk about Amazon reviews, exploratory deliberations need basically four features. And the best known of the exploratory deliberation applications is Amazon reviews, probably for most of us. Um, the first thing they need is exposition. You need to tell people what they're looking at and what they're voting on kind of stuff. Um, at Amazon, we have the description of the book. For example, when it was published, who the author is. Um, some other applications that are like this really cool one, um, Washington's Living Voter, which went over the issues that were on the Washington vote um, during the last election. And it gives like a rundown of the different stuff. There was the legalization of ma marijuana and gay marriage. And they had this whole big complicated thing that you could read. Uh, my advice, if you're programming something for exp exposition, um, keep it short because we all know that if you've read Steve Krug's excellent books about don't make me think about UI stuff, um, people when they go onto a website are unlikely to, lead, to read a block of text more than 300 words long. Um, some people will really soak it up and want more, but make it an option and basically do an elevator pitch. It is a lot better to just jump into the conversation. A lot People will learn from each other and will learn from the conversation more effectively probably than anything that you can put up as exposition. And if you do put up exposition, um, make sure that your descriptions have pictures. <laughs> make sure that you have big headlines on them so people can parse through them faster and understand piece to piece. Um, second thing is polling and surveys. Uh, polling, you know, in Amazon they have the five star thing. Um, you, polling and ranking systems, you can go from, you know, one or two, like th or even just one, thumbs up on Facebook, right? You can have something like that. Um, you want it to kind of fit your issue. And briefly, I'm going to say that um, when you're using different kinds of slider things to allow polling and ranking, um, anything that goes to five, five to ten, personally, I don't like sliders that where you ask people rank one to ten. Um, but if you go five to ten, you're going to go into the territory where you more easily get consensus out of a group. And the reason for, but the reason for this is meaning that more people will agree, will seem to agree. But the reason for this is unfortunate, in my opinion. Because um, my experience with it, the reason why those are popular with certain kinds of, especially the exploratory deliberationists, which tend to be more fuzzy sweater, um, is that it minimizes what they call Bayesian regret, which means that if you constrain people too tightly, then they'll resent it and they'll feel like they didn't have enough decisions. Right? So if you give people five to 10 as the scale, then they're more likely to kind of cluster together. But they cluster in the middle. And the reason for this is um, what we call equality, um, equality or equalization strategies. And so when you give people 10 things, they break it down into three pieces and they throw away the ends. People rarely use the 10, they rarely use the one, and everybody tends to use the ones in the middle. My personal philosophy is on this, if you like study any mathematics, is that we base decisions on cardinality. Like anything over cardinality, and cardinality is the ability to see a number without counting. Human cardinality hovers around five or six. You know, so um, if you see a group of five objects, you'll know it's five. You know, if you see a group of seven objects, you're going to see four objects and three objects and know it's seven, right? But you did another operation there. So if you give people a slider from one to 10, then they break it down into th three pieces. They throw away the ends, and then they start looking at the middle stuff. And that's why you get consensus in there. Um, but you get a much more solid decision if you ask people to bite the bullet and you make them say yes or no. So that's going to show up. But polling and ranking. Um, I don't advise that you go over five, like a five-star system, and that if you're doing polling and ranking, be aware that those, when you give people five options, you're in the realm of like exploratory deliberation. You're going to have a hard time with five options if you're trying to make an actual decision, an election with five candidates. Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. of what to do. I mean, just like the human brain can really only consider so many things, yeah. right? Yeah. And so then, and really maybe 
if, if there actually are a but really multiple, very different ways of you know, doing it. Things, like, and I, I really want to give people like, look, we're, there's some really different ways we could be going about this. Do you suggest maybe I sort of like start at a higher level of abstraction and have Yeah, I'll get to that actually. Oh, it's sorry. coming in. It's okay, because that's a good, that's, that's, you're going to, you immediately start going there, right? And, and so when it comes to like a, like a, a number, like, you know, very uh -huh. satisfied, unsatisfied kind yeah. of stuff, yeah, and, and that, again, like when you're asking somebody to make a personal decision, but when we get into group decisions, then you really want to make it small. But we'll get there. Okay, so the first, the first kinds of deliberation I'm talking about are exploratory deliberations, essentially, where one person makes a decision based on looking at everybody else. So the third thing you need is some kind of analysis. Like when we look at Amazon reviews, then we can see how many people have reviewed the book and what the average is. So that's necessary. And the fourth thing is testimony, which means we allow people to make comments and talk about why they, um, why they rated things or voted things the way they are. With exploratory deliberation, um, the, most, the biggest challenge, I would say, is that often you're working with huge sets of comments. And good analytics, like allowing people to browse comments, are what, um, is kind of what sets apart the men from the boys in terms of the, the applications. Um, the best applications, and I would say if you're into data visualization, like there's a big call to work on deliberative, exploratory deliberations where, for example, um, Washington Living's, Washington's Living Voter, or another one that's kind of cool like that is Oregon's Kitchen Table. Has anybody seen that one? It allows, it's the state of Oregon allows people to kind of weigh in on budgeting and stuff, and they give them a, um, they give them a sample budget of like 100 points and how would you spend it and these kind of things. And then you can look at all the results. Um, kind of cool. So if you get into that stuff, um, just keep in mind that um, the bigger data set you have, where I really see the call with all of the organizations that I see doing that kind of work, they want to be able to um, have better analysis of comments, whether it's like word clouds or, you know, ways that people can adjust filters. You know, that is very important. So when we go into these more complex kinds of um, deliberations, these, are, these, these first four things I talked about, they were exposition, polling or surveys, analysis, and testimony. Those are the things you need to do in exploratory deliberation. Um, when you go into these other more structured deliberations where you have a group of people and they're trying to come to a decision, uh, we have three more things that we need to use. And the first one she's already brought up, and the way that we deal with that is iteration. So you can, you can have iterative surveys, meaning you survey, and then you let people have a bunch of testimony, and people can read each other's comments, and then you survey again. So if you, have te if you actually have 10 options, you can put 10 options there and be like, OK, and the semifinals are, you know, and then you hone it down. So that people can, you, you recognize right off the bat that there's going to be, um, that there is going to be equalization strategies going on. And you're going to have to throw out more than one vote. Um, and another way to get there is ternary voting. When we look at parliamentary procedures, Robert's Rules of Order is what I've been working all year writing an application for that's an online chat application that enforces Robert's Rules of Order. And it works entirely with ternary voting. And ternary voting is to say yes, no, or abstain, right? And so say that you have a decision to make with a group of people. You're going to say, we're going to have a picnic on Sunday. This is the famous deliberative example. We use it all the time. Um, so you ask your group of people, should we have a picnic on Sunday? If they say no, you don't know whether it's because it was Sunday or because they don't want to have a picnic. So you have to break it down. You've got to say, should we have a picnic? And then you float it again be like, should the picnic be on Sunday? And you could say the days of the week and let people pick it that way. But at some point, people are going to be kind of divided between several days. <laughs> you know, so at some point, you're going to be like, OK, there's seven days. We know we extended beyond cardinality. Like half the people want to have it on Wednesday, and the other half want to have it on Sunday. And so then you're going to float the second vote. Wednesday or Sunday, you know, and get it down to two or three. Um, so iteration becomes very important. And ternary voting, typically you say yes, no, or abstain. Like, there are two ways to manage that 
abstention. Um, you can say just yes or no and open a window of time, saying everybody who responds within a certain period of time, your vote counts, right? If you can corral all of the people and you know you have a, a finite voter set and you can get them all to vote, then you can give them yes, no, or abstain and have a meaningful abstention. A meaningful abstention is um, when people refuse to vote because they don't have enough information. So if you can't get a majority of the people to vote, if they just say yes or no, and they just say I abstain, then you're going to have to do more exposition or open up the conversation with another layer of testimony. Um, meaning allowing comments in your system or in your forum, again, for a while until they get a little bit more focused and then you can throw another vote. Um, when we allow just two, op two options and we open a window of time, you know, which is pretty popular with online polls, um, we'll run a poll for a couple days or sometimes for a long period of time, um, then we refer to this as a duocracy, meaning the people who have the action and are doing things are the people who get to vote. Um, please notice that like our presidential elections are a duocracy in this country. We, voting is not mandatory. You show up, and if you show up, your vote counts. If you don't show up, it doesn't, right? Sometimes this is the best way to make a decision. Sometimes it's not. It depends upon the community. So when you're building a deliberative application or an application where you're asking people to make decisions, then this is something you need to take into account. Can you corral the voters? Are they, like, is it mandatory for them to, to, to somehow vote? Or are you just going to leave it open to a window of time? Is a duocracy actually appropriate to the kind of decision you're trying to get? Um, again, notice that with an exploratory deliberation like Amazon Books, you can keep it open forever because it's a personal decision, right? And there's no point at which we need to say this decision needs to go out as a group, right? And so that's a fundamental difference between these kinds of things. Um, so the third thing is ratification. And ratification is a very special kind of vote where everybody agrees that this is what we want to say uh, or this is what we want to do. Ratification comes up in collaborative action applications where you want everybody to take action or agree upon a specific action or um, in terms of a parliamentary procedure where everybody has to take a vote and be like, yes, put our stamp on it. We're going to sign the Declaration of Independence. And so, and that marks the end of your deliberative process. So if you're building an application for collaborative action or for, um, for a parliamentary procedure or to make, you know, an official statement of some kind, put a deadline on it. We're going to ratify at this point. You can always bump your deadline back or mess around with it if your community isn't ready. But be aware that you have to have that finality and that people have to know this is, this is when we ratify. And this is where you really need your participation, is in the ratification. Um, briefly, I want to say about collaborative action applications, which as developers, there's a million exploratory applications out there. We see them all the time. Um, but there is a real call at this point for collaborative action and um, parliamentary procedure applications um, or, you know, things where people can make legally and logically defensible statements. Um, in my experience with the activist community, like many people felt that this was, a, that this was an issue in the Occupy movement, for, any, for example. Um, Occupy was using largely exploratory deliberative procedures, even in their online group, and it was very hard for that group to actually come to a decision because they didn't have a bunch of, they didn't really have the methodologies to, um, to announce and ratify decisions. They didn't necessarily have deadlines, you know. Um, we sometimes refer to this as the tyranny of structurelessness, you know, where it's like it really does help um, to have some structure. I personally, um, last year, coordinated a field trip to Valve software. We, we took a group of gamers up. Super cool. But I used Facebook to do it, to like launch the first thing, like should we go to Valve, right? <laughs> 57 comments through two different statements. I also had like a Google, spread, a Google spreadsheet for the sign up and a bunch of emails floating around to decide like should we take vans or are we going to take our own vehicles, you know, blah, 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 blah. 
you can build an application that will pull all these things together into one application, you know, and allow people to make the votes when they need to make them, and allow people to make the kind of surveys they need to make, and allow a deadline where we can all ratify it, you are golden. <laughs> we need more of these, you know. So um, these are kind of like the offline tools, what I'm talking about. But keep in mind that if you're interested in deliberation, if you're interested in people making decisions online, these are really where you can pull out your chops as a developer and start using this stuff. So I'm going to also talk for a minute about um, speed in deliberation. When we go into these complex forms of deliberation, we want, want a group to make a strong decision together and um, a collaborative action where they all have to make the same decision. The way that we're going to do that, speed is critical because time is the resource. And what happens when people get into exploratory deliberations, especially technocrats like ourselves, is that exploratory deliberations allow people to talk infinitely. You know, and we just get tired because there's nothing getting done. Everybody's just talking, 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 and nothing is getting done. And some of that is because there's simply not the tools to pass it along to the next stage, right? In an exploratory deliberation, they only have those four features. They don't have ratification. You know, they don't have some of this other stuff. So how do we speed it along? Big thing, conflict management. Um, when you get people into, or especially a couple strong talkers start getting into a conversation, you know, you're losing the opportunity to have your decision. A couple ways to go about this that they use in the offline world that we can leverage in the online world. One is have a strong moderator. Just cut people off. So if you are running a forum or if you're building something where there's comments, you might use an actual person to keep them on track. Um, you may try, you know, I'm interested in the long term. For big things, we obviously need moderative AI. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's something I think a lot about. And something that if you're interested in AI, like how, what does it mean in terms of linguistics and how are we going to handle that? The easier way are limits of debate. In Robert's Rules of Order, um, for example, before people can make a statement, they have to get into a queue. They have to put their name on the list and they have to be called by the chairman and allowed to speak. And different kinds of barriers like, you know, just having identity architecture, meaning you have somebody log in, is going to set limits on who's participating on the conversation. Whereas an open public conversation where people don't have to log in may be better for exploratory deliberation. But when you start making decisions, you kind of want a commitment. Um, other limits of debate um, include time. Like typically when somebody testifies before a county council, they'll only have three minutes. You know, as developers, then we can make a text box and limit the characters. So that's a good way to do it. Um, also, you can limit the amount of time that the window of time that a discussion can take place when you have a commenting system or a forum. You know, you can be like, we're going to deliberate for three days on this and then shut down the conversation. Uh, scripting. In Robert's Rules of Order, the way that it moves along is that one person will make a proposal, which we call a motion, and they say, OK, I motion to do this. The next, if anybody approves of it, they just say, I second the motion. So you'll notice that they don't say, I second the motion because the sky is blue, because there's clouds. You know, they, it's scripted. They just say, I second it. And you gave somebody the tool, just a click, just a button or something, to give some kind of um, acknowledgment and um, approval or disapproval without really influencing anything else. So scripting is very important. And I think that Robert's Rules of Order, some things are scripted. I would say about half, um, the application that I'm working on has 24 different actions. Um, and you make a motion. And when you make a motion, you have to make a motion and a statement, right? You make the proposal and you say what you're proposing. Second is a one-stage deal where you just you second it. You say somebody else has to second it and say, OK, let's discuss this. Um, about half of the motions in there are not, um, not debatable. They're scripted, which means when somebody says, you know, previous question, when somebody calls to question, you go straight to vote. You know, that's a point where somebody can, where somebody's made a motion. If the next person says question or go to question, then it means let's vote right now. Let's not even debate it. You know, so um, keep in mind that there are a lot of ways that we could offer people options 
um, that are scripted, I think that can move a deliberation through faster stages. Um, and I'm not even sure what they are. I mean, again, Robert's Rules of Order is, has got a lot of options in there, but not all of them fit in the online world. But I think one of the things that we should think about as developers is um, how can we do this and know that that is part of the thing. Um, when you allow people to take action without making testimony, it's going to speed the deliberation along. Okay, so that's my basic thing. I want to answer some questions and hear what people are working on. Go ahead. Yeah, um, the place that I work at, we work a lot with the online polls and the deliberation. We work with uh, people like Occupy. Yeah, also cool. But it's really, really hard to add consensus and then have like a middle school classroom and be like, like oh, well, we don't even want to use this because it's so complicated. Yeah. There's so many different options. And you, you, you talked a bit about adding all these options, but I'm wondering if there's Yeah, where yeah. it's a huge deal. And I'm a huge fan of Steve Krug and his book, Don't Make Me Think. Um, and, and, and to get, I, the other thing I got to say is that deliberative applications really, really lend themselves well to participative design, which means, if you can go, I really recommend that you kind of build a shell feature um, or uh, you build like a shell of what you want your application to be. You really need to be like super agile, like build the most basic functionality into your application, launch it, and then get feedback from your own community um, and then add functionality as you go, like be agile. So one of the things I would suggest, and the other thing is, is that um, you really want to consider usability as the primary thing um, right off the bat. Like you would be well served to spend time with the community that you're working with and do actually what I ask for from my clients is I actually ask for wireframes because I want them to like give me a visualization of what you think this is actually going to look at, like and I'll take a paper prototype. You know, um, they don't have to like use some kind of software to build it. If they can draw me a sketch, it often helps better than having a conversation where you're trying to say like, um, well, what do you need in an application? And you'll get the interpretive dance, right? So the more you can kind of staple it down and get people to draw you pictures and then go back, make, give yourself a big window for design time and maybe sit down, get somebody to go into the classroom with the kids on the chalkboard and somebody say, this is the square that's the web page. And what if we put this? What if we put that? Do you get it? And understand that some of your functionality may be offline. You know, maybe they're going to talk in the classroom while they fill out the application. You know, you don't really know. But try and figure that out and then do as little as you can and see what you need. Um, yeah, you definitely having a really lean interface. And there's a bunch of really interesting examples of this, though, where people, it's like, yes or no. <laughs> you know, yes or no. And again, don't go over five to ten options because that's, that's the killer. Um, I have a paper actually online and I'll give you the link to it. But it's specifically also about when you're asking people to make decisions to allocate finite resources, um, budgeting, any kind of budgeting question essentially, whether it's about money or any other kind of resources. Um, when you start using numbers, like it's amazing what people, people don't understand percentages. You know, we take our math for granted. But there are people out there that are confounded. And even when you give them, OK, so you have 100 points. You know, and their adding is really bad. And they're confounded by that. And they hate it. So um, I wrote a whole paper with another guy where we talked about if you make a pie chart with movable handles on it, or if you have bar graphs and they're interactive, so you have 100% of the resource. And then when you move one of the bars down, the other bars come up. jQuery UI, the sliders could be programmed to do that. And so that's a really cool way to do it um, so that people can visually allocate a certain amount of stuff without having to deal with numbers or fractions. Ah, fractions. Especially the kids. You know? They'll be able to think of the, the stuff. There's another one called the Poland scheme where you make rows of balls and you put so many balls in the boxes. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, developers for Good is a great resource to do the matchmaking on that. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Um, also, uh, we at the Wikimedia Foundation know that the, currently the online deliberation tools that MediaWiki provides uh, kind of suck. 
And so the <laughs> daily top pages, like, ah, yeah. like this terrible, and we're aware. And Brandon Harris, our senior designer, who gave a presentation yesterday about some things we're doing to combat editor decline, um, he mentioned very briefly something that I say that he's also working on, and uh, we as a foundation are working on called Flow, which is a, a redesigning of how we do workflows, yeah. including top pages, and basically, you know, over the long term, including all the deliberative mechanisms we have on all the wikis. Yeah. Um, and we would, there's a prototype up right now, and we would love for anyone in this room who's interested in how deliberative workflows work, take a look at it, please give us your feedback now. Now is the good time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll go. I'll go hit it, and I'll, I'll like make everybody I know hit it. You know, um, I gotta say a great way to just like go. I'll, I'll, I'll post the list of deliberative applications that I like, but just go hit them. You know, everybody who's writing this stuff, it's like such a new field, and we all need the help of testing and of feedback. And even if you come on and say like, "Oh, this sucks," you know, then we're still like, "Oh my gosh, somebody was there." You know. So okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. It sounds really interesting. Where can we, like, more you know, it's really cool, and and it hasn't my um my prof hasn't let me release the code yet. What? I know, no, shh, wait, uh, there's a whole thing with it, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it is like it got stalled, and it was like this. Hor I I inherited this. I'm the guy was like, it has a few bugs when I came in last year, but I think it's almost done. And he handed me a PHP student developed code base from 1999. Um, yeah, and it had like 128 files. It had the funniest database I've ever seen. It had like a MySQL database where they, it wasn't even keyed. There were just tables that were like floating together and they didn't know any MySQL so there were no joins. So they'd like make one query and then get it and hold it in a variable and then make another query and try and staple it together. I know, it was like, it was, it was madness, you know. And, um, and the UI was all made out of like pop-up boxes. Anyway, <laughs> so, you know, and he did, yeah, no, no, I actually, like, I threw away, you know, it, he did the, the usual thing where it's like, I think it's going to work, I think it's going to work, and I threw away the whole code base pretty much in December and rewrote it, like, on my Christmas vacation. I was just like, you know, I just don't think this, and I was like, I didn't even tell him, I'm just like, I'm just going to throw this away. And so anything that I hadn't rewritten at that point, I have rewritten it. It's now down to like 27 files. The database is fine. I did a lot of database stuff before I went back to school for programming, so the database is pretty lean. Um, and the interface stuff is all running on um, jQuery pretty much. One thing about the architecture of the application is that I consider Robert's Rules of Order a view. Like if we're looking at a, um, a, an MVC kind of thing where basically Everybody is putting stuff into the database, but it's only when you're, it's only on your own machine that you need to see what's actually going on, you know? So the rules are enforced on the data return via um, the jQuery plugin architecture. And this application was originally intended, they wanted to, to have swappable parliamentary protocols where you could put different kinds of protocols in there. So I'm running the Robert's Rules of Order logic on an actual, um, as a jQuery plugin architecture with hopes that eventually there will be like a, a box that you can click and then it'll just go do something else. Um, it was a really cool project and it's not done yet because um, I have gone through a lot. They also, he also thought that he had the logic for Robert's Rules of Order in there and I was like, nah, I don't know what they're doing, you know, part way through it and then I had to like actually go study Robert's Rules of Order. Um, a couple, just before I go to, I want to um, put up a couple other organizations or just give a plug for Democracy Lab. You can find us at democracylab.org or at Democracy Lab. Um, Democracy Lab is a nonprofit that is, actually it's kind of rebooting itself now into a different, um, into a different space where um, the founder, Mark Frischmuth, wants to launch it as a technology incubator for civic engagement applications. And so part of the services will be at OSCON next month here in Portland. Um, and you can find us online, but part of the services that we want to provide is um, that discussion group, the ODDI, the Online Dialogue and Deliberation Infrastructure Group, which is a group of deliberative professionals, about 50 wide, um, nationwide, and some really cool people in there. 
Um, and all of those people are interested in online deliberation, and a lot of them have a lot of experience, even if they're not de developers. Um, so that's a good gr group. You can link to them via democracylab.org. But Democracy Lab is trying to set up a workflow for people to build um, civic engagement applications and deliberative applications. And what we found is that a lot of the funding for this will only, when you apply for funding for civic engagement, it often will only go through a nonprofit. And so Mark is turning his nonprofit into kind of a meta um, umbrella organization that has a project portfolio where if you're building this kind of project, you can, um, you can apply to have it be part of the project portfolio and we'll get the rest of our community to give you some consulting on it and we'll help with grant writing. that are working on deliberative applications. So, like, if you wanted, for instance, do Google Summer of Code and get the mentor payments, like, they'll deal with that? Um, I, I don't know where we're at because we're, we're really hashing it out right now, but it's a good, that's a good question because Google Summer of Code is a, is a nice one. But there's a lot of funding and we're looking at the grant space and it is, Mark's got his first career is in finance and so he's not afraid of handling the money. But he's basically got four applications in the project portfolio right now and part of the thing was, you know, we just want people to like come in. Um, he's of the belief that we need a lot of deliberative applications to address a lot of different needs and he's into open source politics is essentially his thing. So um, whether it's a data project or whether it's an, a more specific like deliberative project um, for small groups, then that's some place to look and <laughs> I'm, now I'm going to start rebuilding the website because I just graduated from school. So you'll see a new website come up out of that probably by next month. Um, the other one I wanted to say was, again, NCDD, the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. They're, um, they're, they've got a lot of online resources that talk about offline methodologies, which are very useful. And you can find me. I'm Ellie Moonjelly. Um, Ellie Moonjelly everywhere. I'm Ellie Moonjelly on Facebook. I'm Ellie Moonjelly on Twitter. I'm Ellie Moonjelly on LinkedIn. Um, and now that I'm out of school, you'll probably see more stuff. I've got to rebuild my own site. Uh, but I'll post the links, I'll post them on the page for this talk. I'll post links to different deliberative applications. Um, you'll probably see eLiberate, I'm trying to push it into Democracy Lab's portfolio. And so hopefully I'll be able to release the code on that. Um, and <laughs> you know, the, big, the biggest problem on that was the polling architecture. That was the other thing is that it's like pulling, like long polling on Apache, his, his shared hosting cheap shared hosting, wouldn't support more than four users, you know? Seriously, it's like three, it was fine. And then four, it was like replication hell. Yeah? Um, I'm wondering if uh, there are uh, geographically-based uh, deliberation uh, initiatives? Uh, you know, that is the other application that I'm working on called Civitas, which is a mapping application. Um, it is deliberative. And the, the, the thing with Civitas, which is also, it's an augmented reality game, I have a, I have actually a big proposal, which is my grant proposal on it, and you can find it at, um, there's a link to it actually on the page for this, but you can find it at Civitas ARG dot org slash Civitas ARG dot PDF. And that's like a 15 page thing, and it goes into it, what essentially that application is, is where you can go to a Google Maps and you can drop a marker. You can either drop a marker to invite people to a political event that you're holding, like a protest or something, or you can drop a marker to start a conversation that, some, that something is going to happen here. And the goal of the conversation is a collaborative action. So everything either is started on the map or, or it's got to be discussed and go back to the map. And then it, it opens a conversation in the forum where people discuss it and they have to set a where, a when, and what are we going to do? And then they ratify that, and it becomes an event on the map. So it's based on a point on a map rather than a boundary. Like a yeah, but part of it is, um, and this is the part that's hanging me up on that application, um, is that I, it <laughs> involves people. You get premium points in the game, because it's gamified. You get premium points for face-to-face -face confrontations with the politarchy, which is the political class. And so it involves going out and trying to meet like your city council members and you get bigger points for this. And the politicians can play too. If they acknowledge that they saw the protest, then you get bigger points for that. Um, the whole thing is set in like an ancient Roman 
theme where it's like the citizen versus the politarchy. I started this, I, I gotta say one of the cool things about this is that I went to the NCDD conference um, in October and two weeks later I went to um, Seattle Interactive Conference which was like gamers and new media people and what I found was that in the deliberative aspect we were all talking about how do we gamify politics so that people will play harder and participate more and then I went and I saw these game speakers and they were like how can we bring our game psychology into the real world to make a difference you know <laughs> I saw this great and it, I was just like ah you know it's just really wonderful um, I saw this great guy that was talking about um, the free-to-play model and he was like we imagine free-to-play everything like how do you do free-to-play healthcare? you know I mean, so very very cool so um, this is a whole different thing, the gamification of civic engagement. Um, one place that I love on this, I should make a master list of my links, um, is the civic, what is it called, the Engagement Game Lab out of Emerson. And Emerson Tufts, they've done some really cool stuff with like civic technology and, and gamification. Um, and they do card games and stuff. At, uh, at Evergreen in Cyril, which is where I just finished my undergraduate research, it's the Civic Intelligence Research and Action Lab. We have a games cluster, and they look at civic engagement um, and civic intelligence in-game, including reviewing video games for their civic intelligence, and what do they tell us about this, the civic world, you know? So there's a lot of that going on. Um, the Knight Foundation, if you browse the Knight Foundation's um, the Night News Challenge was one of the big funding opportunities of this for us in civic engagement over the last year. And their site is still up, and there were a number of games in there. And if you just browse the proposals, you can see some really so cool stuff going on with civic engagement games. But one of the things I believe about um, public participation and political participation is that politicians are good at politics because they love to play. And I always say you don't work a piano, you play a piano. And being able to play is critical for virtuosity. And so one of the problems that we have as citizens is that it's not fun to go to a city council meeting. You know, that's not our version of playing. And so how do we get citizens to play the game the same way politicians have played us for years? You know, <laughs> <laughs> they want to do it. Even when they lose, they go back. And um, Greg Kloomer from Valve actually made a great comment to me at, at um, Seattle Interactive. He was like, what we have found about games is that it does not matter whether people win or lose. They can lose bad, and they'll just come back and play harder. They're in it for the drama, you know? And so are the politicians, and so do we need to be, you know? And so anything you can do to, like, you know, make your political p participation, like, more exciting and more interesting, I got to say about um, Mark Frischmuth, who started Democracy Lab, is that um, he's like a big sports freak, you know? And he's always watching football and, and always watching games and doing it, you know, like this. And he actually started Democracy Lab after, um, in 2006, you know, after the election, um, after the national presidential election and, and the, the electoral college. And I think that's interesting because you know, many people were disappointed with that election because they didn't win or lose their own thing. He was profoundly disappointed with that election because he felt that the people were not well represented. And he was so, like, hung up about it that he went and started a nonprofit, you know, and, like, went after that thing. And so it's not just about politicians. Um, one of the cool things, I think, is that there's a market out there for us to raise money from people who don't want to give to political candidates but want to give to citizenship and want to give to citizenry. And there's more and more of a movement toward direct democracy. I think online deliberation is crucial to that. Anything else before we wrap up? Um, just to ask, and I'm very curious because I'm a little behind here. Um, coming, from a, you know, coming from a country where democracy is still growing, yeah. um, what do you think is the potential for your projects to foster democratic participation in countries where you know, this is the cool thing about Civitas. At one point, I had these weird dreams, and I was talking to a kid at a party who was like, this is important, and I don't know why. And I was like, it is important. Civitas is actually an open source application that allows people to um, democratically deliberate for a direct action, right, and map it. 
Um, right now, where we see countries, when there's political unrest in countries that don't have democracy, typically they'll knock out Facebook or Twitter during riots. You know, we see that all the time. And it's totally possible to do with privately owned software that's coming out of a, a set IP, you know? Um, an open source application like Civitas, one of the things I realized is that people could take the software and just roll it. You know, you could use the, sti the Streisand effect, and I call these like sister nations. My game would not be the only game in town. Other people could start rolling it out, and you could even use static HTML tiles for the map, you know? So um, I realized it, like, I felt like, you know, my, my thoughts on it, because I thought a lot about micro scale and macro scale, and I really love hyperlocal stuff, which is why I started working with Civitas. But globally, um, deliberative applications that are open source deliberative applications can be unblockable, because we can just roll them right over. And we don't have anything like that right now. You know, I mean, a lot of the forums and and social networks that people are using as the mainstream stuff are not well suited. Like my trying to do the the, um, the field trip on Facebook sucked, you know. But anything that's suited for collaborative action and uses a democratic process to get there and is open source, I mean, to me, that ta starts to talk about virtualization of politics. And I think, like, remember when MP3s came? We didn't realize that it was like the CD was going to disappear. And when we talk about virtualizing government, what does that mean for physical government? Anywhere. You know, that's a really cool, that's a very cool revolution, I think. I am thinking a lot at this point in my career about how much of government needs to be physical. And maybe we are in a place to do it. Okay, anybody who wants to ask me more questions, I'll be around here, I'll be in the hall. Thank you, you guys.